says that the argument is a long way from the uh, so from the uh, solipsism that she finds in being in nothingness. Although I'm not really sure about that. Um, I, I don't think it's that far a leap. And she criticizes him for his stupefying ambiguity in the use of the word freedom. Uh, freedom, he uses it as a tendency of consciousness to flicker into reflection. Sometimes consciousness is unreflexive, uh, stuck, in, stuck on things in the world, and sometimes it just flickers into consciousness of uh, of consciousness, maybe, of everything. Uh, let's see, purging of emotions, uh, but also freedom is also in a purging of emotions and a respect for autonomy. And it's very similar to the Kantian will of both Kant and uh, Rousseau, according to uh, Murdoch. So, freedom has three stages. Uh, the absurd, which is the emptiness in consciousness, the reflective power, the disciplined avoidance of illusion. I guess the world is an absurd illusion, and then sometimes we reflect. And then the third state is the ideal state, uh, which he says she calls a modified form of socialism, where we interact with other people in an ideal way, but not in a real way, perhaps. Getting on to chapter seven, she writes uh, the romance, the name of the chapter is The Romance of Rationalism. Sartre does not believe in God, nature, or history, but he does believe in reason. She says that uh, in his solipsistic universe, and she repeats over and over again that his universe does tend towards solipsism, so he's the only person in his universe. Um, other people do enter his universe, uh, but they enter it kind of evilly. Uh, they, they all have the gaze of the Medusa, a gaze that will freeze you um, like the Medusa does and turn you into stone. For Sartre, the eye is unreal, the real is the other. Uh, the other is sinister, opaque, and unintelligible. So uh, not a very good other there. Sartre asserts the absolute value of the moment and the individual without explaining why they're valuable. So that seems to be a problem uh, that you have, uh, he, he just takes it as an absolute that the individual is, uh, is important in an absolute value. Uh, and she says that's why Marxists don't really like Sartre all that much because he's non-social and he's non-historical and Marxism is social, it is historical. So we have with Sartre an individual without hope. Uh, for him, reason is sacred, but it's fruitless. It doesn't lead anywhere. It's, uh, oh, impotent. It doesn't do anything. Uh, so I guess um, she says that the only satisfied rationalists are scientists and Marxists. So Sartre being a rationalist is a dissatisfied rationalist. Okay, chapter eight, picturing consciousness. Again, she, re she repeats there's three modes of consciousness for Sartre, but um, I guess she changes a little bit. First there's the unreflective self-awareness, then there's being reflective, and then there's being for others. Um, others label us, we label other people, and so there is this interaction, but the interaction is no more than just labeling. We're just labeling the, uh, the other, and the other is labeling us. The next last chapter, the impossibility of incarnation. Uh, she finds the there are two objections that we can make to Sartre's philosophy. First, we can say it's arbitrary and incomplete. Second, we can say that he's hypostatizing uh, the mind to form an imaginary and indemonstrable substance. So he's an essentialist who does see the individual mind as having some kind of essential being. Uh, and in this he's kind of copying Freud, but she says perhaps it's better uh, that we should call, uh, say that Freud is a metaphysician and that Sartre is just copying Freud and being a metaphysician rather than saying that Freud is being psychological. And we can criticize Freud for being metaphysical in a lot of ways. Sartre has an egocentric philosophy with no universal theory of the self. 
So, although uh, he takes the self as the absolute, and he kind of describes it this way or that way, um, it, it, he kind of see how does it come about uh, this essential self uh, that can be that's free to be anything, but somehow uh, has to be a certain way. Sartre treats others as objects to be feared, uh, manipulated, and imagined. And she uses a wonderful description. She says that love for Sartre is a battle between two hypnotists locked in a closed room. She says uh, Sartre is against uh, emotion. The emotion is an imperious, uh, infantile gesture for Sartre. Uh, the language language is just for the other, so we don't have emotion, we don't have language, or emotion is uh, infantile, language is for the other, it's just uh, seduction or command, that's all that language amounts to. You're either trying to seduce someone or command them, and I'm not even sure if there's much of a distinction for Sartre between the two, between seduction and command. We can take action in the world. Uh, those are our communal tasks to take action, but action for Sartre is more a flickering between reflective moments and an outside point of view like history or science. But these outside points of view, history and science, are he says it's bad faith that you're kind of interrupting your meditation on yourself. Um, that's my interpretation actually. Uh, what she's saying that uh, History, history of science. He does say history of science is really bad faith, or at least she interprets her, him as saying that. And so, Sartre is a political philosopher, but uh, for him, uh, politics is just a philosophical solution uh, to solipsist to his solipsist dilemma. It's a way of him getting out of himself. So he uses politics to get out of himself, which is perfectly okay. Uh, if you know if you're stuck in a solipsist uh, I guess matrix you want to get out of it and maybe politics is the way to get out of it and that's the way that Sartre uses Sartre uses to get out of it but he says that she says that he's also a pra pragmatic utilitarianism utilitarianist when it comes down to it uh, well his ethics are really individualistic and Kantian ethics that's all that we find there. Sartre ultimately is, is just performing the traditional tasks of the philosopher. He is reflecting systematically about the human condition. And she, she does criticize him in two ways, for being arbitrary and incomplete and for hypothesizing the, the mind. Uh, but she says that the second criticism really isn't a good criticism. Uh, that he's just doing what Freud did and he's being metaphysical, but that's okay because that's what philosophers often do. But it's his arbitrariness and incompleteness that he really can't stand. So, ultimately, this is the picture that emerges of Sartre from Iris Murdoch. Sartre is a solipsist who thinks he's in bad faith with himself by pursuing a liberal, social, democratic, political agenda. I guess he would prefer to just meditate all day on himself, but the world calls him out, and so he has to do something. It seems that Sartre is just a Catholic without God, hating the flesh and the world, so he follows the, the Catholics in that, and loving the rational self uh, with any reason. Uh, he doesn't believe in God, so it's not that he loves the rational self because God created it, created the rational self, and therefore we should love God. So he just loves the rational self without any reason. He has all the torture of a Catholic soul without the mythological redemption in God. It should be noted again that this picture was drawn by Murdoch of the early Sartre in 1953, and Sartre apparently did change quite a bit and many times after this particular period. But I think Murdoch gives a wonderful description of Sartre up until the year 1953 when she wrote this book.